Welcome to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. I'm Dr. Edmund Sulkowski, and today on Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dennis Courtney. Doctor, welcome to Healthy Pets, Dr. Healthy Edmund, Owners. Dr. Edmund, it's so nice to see you again. Thanks for the invite. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show, Doctor. You, you're just a wealth of information, knowledge, and treatment, and I appreciate you very much, and we're lucky to have you in, this, in the Pittsburgh, greater Pittsburgh area. You're, you're an asset to this community. And I wanted to bring you on. We, uh, last time you were on Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners, we were discussing stem cells. And, and by no way was that hour long enough to, to, to yeah, get through stem topic. cells. Yeah, yeah, so I wanted you to come back to continue that topic. So our topic today on Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners is, again, stem cells with Dr. Dennis Courtney. First of all, I want to mention that the Dr. Courtney is going to be on my radio program, Healthy Pets, Healthy People. And that show will air live at, on AM 1250, The Answer, this Saturday 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and you have an opportunity to actually call in and ask Dr. Courtney questions which is something we can't do on the TV program okay. dog but it's it's a great show again about information and education so that's uh, this Saturday which is the 13th of January and that's a.m. 1250 uh, 9 o'clock in the morning from 9 to 10 Dr. Courtney will be on the show live in the studio so you'll have a great opportunity there well Dr. Courtney Tell us what a stem cell is again. It's good to start from the beginning. Yes. And there's it, no better and that's start a blank that. cell, which is the beginning. Yeah. So, and the word, and really, the emphasis is on the word blank. So, a stem cell is a cell that hasn't determined what cell type it's going to be yet. It has the potential to ultimately declare to become any cell in the human body, and it be able to specialize. For whatever organ that is so it can become a brain cell it can become a heart cell become a liver cell a cell in the joint a cell in the lung we all have evolved from stem cells in utero and we literally were formed because of these declarations that were made during pregnancy in utero so these cells have no coding basically on them and they need to be coded is that a way to look at it uh, they are going to follow the ultimate code which is somebody's DNA. So the, it's the DNA that determine all of us and every part of us. But still there has to be a delineation of what's going to become what because it all starts from the blank and then it moves into hundreds of different substrates that are possible, all the various organs. And each one of these places in the body, it works differently. And how it's formed determines its metabolic pathway and how it's going to perform. But it all starts from that blank. So in the embryonic stages, we're starting out with these blank cells. And do we have a lot of those blank cells in that stage when we're in There's the no time in our entire lives where we have more stem cells than we do at this particular phase of our lives. So um, this is all happening in a closed-off environment in the uterus, but... Uh, at birth, um, as a neonate, as a newborn, we are seething with all sorts of stem cells at that particular time. And as time moves on, the population of these blank cells is going to diminish gradually and slowly to a point where they almost become non-existent. Is that when we stop growing? Uh, we were talking about this before we went on the air, and um, to be honest with you, no one would ever think a 15-year-old to be over the hill in anything. It's almost absurd. But I'd have to say, by the age of 15, the number of stem cells has dropped off considerably. The population has dropped off considerably. In fact, the stem cell population of a 15-year-old is pretty much on par with the stem cell population of a 60-year-old. You have to explain that a little further. Is that good or bad? Well, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's the phase, we needed all those stem cells at a time when we were growing. And as our growth comes to an end, the need for the, so many blanks cells comes to an end. And really, by the age of 15, you're all formed. I mean, the height and weight and everything, with small exception, is already predetermined. And once early adulthood comes around, in our early 20s, there is no more need for growth. We do nothing but probably revert backwards. Well, I have a joke about that, but we won't say that. All right. So, so 
What happens is the lack of stem cells actually starts to initiate our aging process? Um, it, it certainly initiates the ability to move for, word forward and backward probably are well placed there. Moving forward happens all the time when we need our growth to occur. Our, um, but once we're fully grown, we do not need the stem cells in a way that we did before. And the drop off is naturally going to be uh, diminished considerably because we don't need them anymore. So as we start to age, and we, de we develop gray hair, we get wrinkles, we, um, our metabolic rate slows maybe a little bit and so forth. If we had stem cells, would that increase all those? Would well, that, would that change those things enough, around? Interestingly enough, we're learning, um, and thank God, it's one of the few things that we have now in medicine is just, just re reaching a, a, a point of launching, okay? This, this thing with stem cells is really hot right now in medicine. I believe it is going to be the future of medicine. The next decade or two, we're going to see a whole bunch of uh, potential in using stem cells uh, that we don't even use today because we don't have to worry about inventing some technology. This is biology. This isn't technology. And biology has been with us since life began. So to harness that and be able to intervene when tissue is aging, when there has been damage to it, because we can bring a new batch of blank cells into the arena and have them literally regenerate. A new organ, a new body part is... Body part including an ear or a nose? You name it, it is potential. So where, where are we getting these new blank cells from if we're not producing them because we're past 15 years of age? Well, you know, um, now that stem cells are entering the medical marketplace, that's a very good question that you ask because there's really only two sources to be able to harvest stem cells that we can use in this medical medium of ours. The one that it all started with back in 2005, and I think that's about the dawn of when stem cells were reintroduced into the medical arena, um, is the type of stem cells that come from you and go back to you. So there's a whole uh, uh, arena in the stem cell treatment where you are both a donor and the recipient. A donor, they take it from our... They take it from you, take them from you, and they give them back to you. The sources for where they harvest these from in us is usually either the fat, body fat, or the bone marrow. They take a specimen of these two body uh, cellular areas, and then they manipulate over about a three-hour period to extract the stem cells only from the fat or from the bone marrow, and then they give that back to the same person, but now that person is a recipient. But there's a concentrated number of stem cells that are placed in an area to do the job that they did when we were in, u in utero, and there wasn't a specific area because it was all the organs at that time. So these are adult stem cells. Is that what the term is? Well, they are stem cells. They are adult stem cells, and they need to declare. So the first step on the way to the regenerative process is this blank has to declare to be something. And in a simplistic way, it just has to land on it to make the declaration process proceed. So is that where most of the stem cells are harvested, harvested from, from? I'd say from the it all started in 2005 with that. And uh, right now there are about 600 stem cell clinics in the United States. In a way, I actually don't think that's all that many. I think there should be 6,000. And I think we're going to be seeing 6,000. But of these 600 clinics, greater than 90% of them are using autologous stem cells, the cells that come from you and go back to you. So those are your own? Those are your own. And there's an appeal to that uh, because the doctor would say, look, this is something that comes from you and goes back to you. So you really can't hurt you, can you? And I think that's true. I think that uh, for the most part, there's something mm -hmm. soothing about hearing 
that, oh, okay, you're going to give something that I already have, and you're going to give it back to me. Well, that loses its soothe if you consider that as we age, and we started our conversation with this, we really don't have any stem cells. So if you want to have a regenerative process begin, you need a lot of stem cells. And the more stem cells you can use, the greater potential there's going to be to cause regeneration of a new of the body part you're trying to recreate and regenerate. This is where the newer form of stem cells come in because we have another form, and I believe it's a superior form. And that form, the big word, medically called heterologous stem cells, as opposed to autologous, which comes from you. Heterologous stem cells come from another human being and go to you. Another other human being happens to be newborn babies delivered by scheduled C-section, where at the time of the delivery, the umbilical cord is taken, and the cells inside that cord are, are stem cells. Yeah, we're not taking the cells from the baby. We're taking them from the, the As, uh, umbilical right, cord, which gets thrown away. There are no moral or ethical issues. This is not coming from aborted fetuses. In fact, in 2001, President George Bush signed a law making that completely illegal. That, that just can't happen. But the public is well attuned to, oh, my God, is this one of the, those... Uh, yeah, we want to make that clear. No. Uh, the FDA oversees the processing of these cells. There are rigorous standards that the few companies, and there are only a few, that actually do the harvesting and do the processing have to maintain in order to get FDA approval to put that cell out in the marketplace. But these, I believe, are the kinds of stem cells that offer us the greatest potential to do the greatest amount of good, as opposed to autologous, which um, yes, it's coming from you, but there are so few of them that the likelihood of you getting the benefit that you're trying to achieve is pretty diminished. So again, just to make it clear for everybody, these are not coming from a fetus or, or a newborn. They're coming from the umbilical cord placenta, which is normally thrown away. Right. Af after the delivery of the baby at, the, at a scheduled C-section, um, it's scheduled because we know the date, we know the time. So the surgeon delivers the baby, hands the baby off to the pediatrician in the OR, and then turns back to the patient and delivers the placenta and the cord and hands them off to the awaiting surgical team that was dispatched by the company to then take those two organs back to home base and within four hours of arrival, process those cells, cryo or freeze those cells until I call up to order the cells, and um, they're taken from the freezer, FedEx to me overnight, and we're ready to go the next day. So what you're getting are these blank, undifferentiated cells right. in, in abundance. In, a, in abundance, and I want to emphasize the word abundance because there is no part of the fetus, of the newborn, that has a greater concentration of stem cells than the umbilical cord. Because that was the lifeline. That was the lifeline. Very good. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. So knowing you and your practice over the years, you've always been in the forefront of many technologies. And, and I know that you personally look for the root causes and the cures, and not just the support. Medicine tends, and I don't, you can agree or disagree with me, but medicine tends to, I say, cut it away, sew it back on, or suppress it, and not really look at what's causing the problem and how do we fix that. Now, I don't care if that's high blood pressure or diabetes. That's, how, that's, in my opinion, how things are looked at. You always look at, okay, what's the cause of this? So somebody walks in and they have arthritis, <coughs> and you now have the ability to take <coughs> these stem cells, <coughs> inject that into, a, say, a knee, for example, that, that may be, the suggestion may be for that patient to have surgery for that knee. And you inject these stem cells, these blank cells into that knee and get a result where surgery is prevented? This has been the most amazing observation over these last couple of years. And I've only been involved with stem cells for approximately two years. But it has brought into the practice the ability to do what 
appear to me very, uh, very often case to be just miraculous. Uh, remember, I'm an anesthesiologist and working chronic pain problems and uh, treating them for a 30-year career has been in my backyard. That's what anesthesiologists, they run the pain clinics of this country and they do a darn good job of doing it. But over this time frame, I'm always searching for that therapy which is head over heels better than the one that preceded it. And I've got to tell you, nothing's ever made the leap as well and demonstrated the potential as well as stem cells now have. So I'm excited, can you tell? Oh, and yes, I, I, I'm, absolutely. I'm enthusiastic, I'm very passionate about this because watching the treatment of chronic pain problems for as many years as I've been doing so, this one is the home run. I always hope there could be, but now finding out that there actually are, you mentioned these joint problems. Um, I'd have to say the three biggest joints uh, that I have to, to deal with are knees, hips, shoulders. Yeah. And by the way, in that order, the knee is the number one yes. area. Now, people who are afflicted with the various degenerative diseases of a lifetime, up till now, I think what their option has been is they're put on either anti-inflammatories or in the newer arena, immunosuppressants. And this is an attempt to delay and slow down this degenerative process, but in no way is it meant to correct it as, as all of medicine seems to be involved with, right? With the use of drugs. So now here we go, we have a person suffering for 20 years plus. Their orthopedic surgeon who they're in contact with says, Look, we'll reach a point one day when we're probably going to have to do a joint replacement. These gentlemen are extremely well trained, a uh, set of hands on them that amaze me. Um, and ultimately, the day comes and the patient is told, you know what, it's now time. We need to go give you the new knee or the new hip or the new shoulder, and we can do all three. Um, but I've now found that this is probably, this is going to be a thing of the past because th there's no longer, there's no longer a need to have surgery next up. Let's just put it this way. Surgery should never be next up. It should be last up. That's absolutely correct. And we didn't know there was a step in between the drugs and the surgery, but now it's just been demonstrated so often. There most certainly is. And so if you are suffering from joint discomfort, joint pain, you got two options here. You don't have to wait, as the orthopedic surgeon has been telling you. Let's just keep monitoring you. Let's just, we'll watch you. Meanwhile, you've got the agony every day of this watch that never ends. Well, you don't have to wait it out anymore. And the limitations that pain puts on you. Every single day. And those artificial joints are really temporary measures because they fail over time. Well, there's a, an adage in the, in the realm of the orthopedic world. You can't do that too soon. Like the 50-year-old who feels like, God, I wish I could get this pain. They're too young. The surgeon will be very reluctant mm -hmm. to do a joint replacement on somebody that young. And they're very expensive. And you have a rehabilitation period that you have to go through. Uh, it, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. But but I understand the reason why it's done, because that was the only alternative that was before. The way, and the patients going through the rehab ultimately get to the point where they don't have pain. So it was good. It was a good experience for them. Yet, as I speak to them now, um, to hear that there's because they did one knee. Let's say it was their right knee. OK, uh, but they got a left knee that might be be problematic for them. Well, too. I'm going to interject something here. So I had a friend, uh, elderly man come to me and, and we talked about the pain in his knees and he's been unable to walk very well, not very stable in his, with his gait. And uh, I talked to him about stem cells with you and, and uh, he said, well, do I do both knees or one knee? And my comment to him was, you know what, try one knee. If it works, then you go do the other knee. Well, he did that probably, and I know you know who I'm talking about. Yes, we don't mention do. any names. I certainly do. That's, probably three months ago, and I spoke with this gentleman two, two weeks ago, and he said to me, I'm about to get the other knee done because I'm, I'm walking so much better and I'm without pain. So it took about three months for him to, to 
all of a sudden have the little light bulb that clicked on and said, gee, I'm leading with a leg that I couldn't walk on. That's a very nice story. By the way, you're the one that told me that he's done so well, and I do know who you're talking about. And um, that gentleman um, he's still vital and still out there every day and participating in life, but he's in his 90s. He's in his 90s. And, and, and he, he doesn't want to be in a wheelchair. He doesn't want to be behind a walker. And in fact, I just saw him this Friday, and he, he got up and walked a whole heck of a lot better than I've seen him for the last year. Yeah, that's so, very so, encouraging. But this is what I've seen, Edmund, and so it's repeated over hundreds of times now. Um, it's always good to have the success story. Thank you for mentioning. I was happy to hear it for him. Um, I'd like to say everything's 100%. Nothing's 100% in medicine, but we're well into the 90% of successes, and that is a number that I'm pretty proud of. Are there side effects to having, having these stem cells put in? You know, um, I've always prided myself because I don't just do pain work, but I always look for therapies that have little to no side effects. And when compared to the drugs that I could write for by prescription and choose not to, this is always a key with me. I'm really not interested in being involved with anything that has risk. I find that stem cells have a little to none, and here's why. Um, anytime you take tissue from another human being and put it into a different human being, we have this issue of a rejection reaction we, we're all familiar with, right? Um, a transplanted organ immediately the day it's put into the recipient. Body this is a problem. This is a problem. And so you have a, to suppress the immune the system. The immune system yeah. recognizes that is foreign and it begins attacking it. So a good question would be, well, they're just thinking, well, isn't there a problem if I use these cells coming from another human being? And oddly enough, um, and in a wonderful way, that cannot happen with umbilical cord cells because the umbilical cord cells are one of three cell types in the human body that have immune privilege and do not evoke a immunological response of that type. So where an organ could hit the tripwire to cause major and will cause major issues, cells that come from the umbilical cord cannot because they are immune privileged. They're universal. And as such, there will be no immunological response. So there could be some local discomfort at the joint site, which is minimal. But um, I like the fact that I'm not, I don't have to concern myself with what could be devastating when it comes to other people's tissue, um, which is there's uh, a rejection reaction. There is no such thing. You know, you know I'll, I sit on the Washington County uh, Drug and Alcohol Commission, and opioid addiction among aged people is, is actually very high. Because of these because chronic Because of these chronic problems that everyone's having, and you take these pain pills to keep your level of pain down, and you become addicted to it, and it throws off yeah. your whole body and your body function and your mental processes and everything. It's such a big problem. So this is actually kind of amazing. Now, I, I want... We're going to continue with this, of course, but I wanted to interject something right now. Not only do you treat, but you educate. And as far as I'm concerned, Healthy Pets, Healthy People is the radio show, and Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners, this show, is about education. That's, that's why we're here. Education to me is key because you cannot make an informed consent decision if you don't know all the facts. Well, and, that's so true. And what Dr. Courtney is doing is he's holding every, monthly a seminar, free seminar, at the Airport Marriott Hotel, right off the Parkway, mm -hmm. Parkway West, Parkway right? Parkway West, and, one tour exit. And uh, your specific topic on this free conference is stem cells. So I know that your first conference uh, in January is January 12th, the uh, 15th, right. January 15th. January 15th, a yeah. Monday night at seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, and do you, do you need to call and make a reservation for that? I would like for those that think they'd like to be in that audience to uh, call and reserve a seat. The number to do that is 724-749-4558.
So we're really, un we go into some detail here, but we're unable to go into extensive detail. On that conference, you actually go into great detail and show, show slides and so forth of healing. Do you do things like that in the conference? I'll tell you what, this conference, um, and when you talk about education, you're talking to an educator. You were, doctor was high an educator teacher. Be before he went into medicine. Uh, high school teacher. So uh, education has been um, a fertile ground for me for my entire career. It's not a patient that doesn't walk into my office that their education doesn't begin the moment they step foot in my office. So I'm a big proponent of educating them. And when I look at the um, consumer of, of, of these medical things, the, the American public, uh, they are not prepared, are not adequately prepared to be able to make a decision about an informed decision you were talking about informed consent. The consumer needs to have the ability to make an informed decision, and he does not have enough facts to do so. This now has evolved to the presentation of this seminar. I entitled the seminar, it's a catchy title, it's called Stem Cells 101. And as anyone who is involved with education knows, the first course in any endeavor is a 101 course. There's English 101, there's History 101, there needs to be a stem cells 101 that a person can come in and become educated enough that they could lead, enter, I say you enter intrigued, you should leave empowered. And I'm very certain that I'll be able to accomplish that in an hour because I've developed what I refer to as this Dr. Courtney seven point checklist. I believe that in that hour, I'm going to be able to explain well enough what it is, what the seven questions are that you need to ask if you're going to entertain the stem cells from any practitioner. And by the answers that you'll get, you're going to know that that's the right way to proceed or not. We want to get that number out again, Dr. Cronin, because we're about to go to a break here. The number again is 724-749-4558. That's at the Airport Marriott off, off of Parkway uh, West. Parkway West. Montour exit on uh, January 15th at 7.30. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Call to reserve a seat. Okay, we're going to go to a commercial break. We'll be back with Dr. Courtney in a few minutes. We'll see you then. <laughs> brings us together and adds flavor to life. That's why it's important to wash hands, surfaces, and fresh produce. Keep raw meat, poultry, and seafood separate from ready-to-eat foods like fruits and vegetables. And cook to proper temperatures using a food thermometer. Enjoy! refrigerate leftovers within two hours. For more tips on safely preparing foods, visit homefoodsafety.org. Welcome back to Healthy Pets, Healthy Pe Owners. I'm Dr. Ed Sulkowski and we're here with Dr. Dennis Courtney. Before break, Doc, we were talking about stem cells. I want to mention again about your seminar that's being held because I think it's so important for our listeners to hear this and to show up at the sem se seminar because it's, it's Stem Cells 101, the basic introduction to learning how stem cells can help you. And that's on January uh, 15th, 15th at Monday. 7 o'clock at the Airport Marriott on West Parkway West. At, you said to get off the Montour exit. And it's free. The number to call is 724-749-4558. You're holding this seminar again in February on February 12th at 7 o'clock again. We intend to do them monthly. And then you're having also one on eyes that we're going to talk about on February 13th. So I just wanted to get that out there now. So as a, as a patient or as a person that's having a difficulty, what issues bring me to the seminar? What issues bring me to Dr. Courtney and stem cells? 
Well, we hope that as people listen to, for instance, what we're talking about today, that if you have an issue with your joints, I think that the arena Probably of the number one issue, huh? Th this is the one place that this has been tried, true, and demonstrated to have a miraculous high percentage of uh, complete turnarounds. Obfuscating the need for surgery is one of my biggest thrills to find out the person doesn't need the surgery now when in fact, literally a month earlier, they were, they were on the surgical schedule. So there is an option available. You don't have to wait to get to that point. I think that's the other thing to say. If you have joint issues, and particularly the big three, knees, hips, or shoulders, uh, it would really benefit you to come on out to become educated. Uh, the full name of this lecture is Stem Cells 101, How an Educated Consumer Can Make the Decision to Change Their Lives. And we had mentioned that we want to be informed to be able to make a decision. I'm all about education, and I believe that right now the consumer is vulnerable. They don't know enough. They have to rely on the goodwill, which I believe there's plenty of in the medical community, but it might be that the very doctors who are using it don't know. And I find this to be unbelievably uh, uh, possible that the fact that even if you deal with a stem cell clinic, their intentions are good, but they may not have the right products in order to make certain that at least this becomes a likelihood for you. And again, what you're referring to is harvesting adult stem cells from belly fat as opposed to getting blanks in abundance stem cells from, from placenta and umbilical cord. That's tissue. right. That one statistic, and I say it again, 600 clinics out there today across the country, greater than 90% of them use autologous only. I believe that there's a much better uh, harvesting um, capability here when we use the umbilical cord of newborns and the amount, the number of stem cells is just no, no comparison. So if I walked in for a procedure for my knees or my hips, you have this formula of stem cells and you're injecting that directly into the site. Is there, is there a lot of pain involved in that? Um, the site will be, in these three joints cases, a capsule. There's a capsule that surrounds. I always do like the knee as an example because I think people can literally visualize it. But there's a capsule that surrounds five things. The five things are bones, the big one on top, the smaller one on the bottom, a membrane around the bone called the synovium, uh, cartilage in between the bones, and ligaments and tendons. So just about every joint in the human body is made up from those five things. But they exist within a capsule. So the clinician, the doctor, has to penetrate the capsule, get into the capsule, and deliver the package, the stem cells, into the capsule, which is walled off now. These cells can't really escape. They're encased within the capsule, and now these cells randomly land on one of five things. So they're going to hit the cartilage, which, which generally doesn't have a blood supply in the middle, just at the ends. That's right. There's really very minimal blood supply within the capsule. So you're able to regenerate cartilage sometimes with this? There are five tissues in there. And going back to what we started with, these are blank cells that can become anything. They can become all five. And so it only becomes a matter of, in a random fashion, and um, I say that uh, I, I, the kind of cells I use has a minimum of 10 million cells in a one milliliter vial. I'm guaranteed that by the company. Well, if you can put 10 million cells into the capsule, they're randomly going to land on five things. So are they increasing synovial fluid in there as well? Uh, well, the synovium, a healthy synovium, which is the membrane, makes that fluid. Oh. <laughs> if, if those that land on the membrane become brand new synovium, and you better believe a synovial membrane will make a whole bunch of synovial fluid that it couldn't make prior because there wasn't enough brand new synovium. It was old, it was degenerative, and as a result, 
the pain and discomfort of the joint. Do you see the picture? Yes. Yeah. So, so this, these comments we hear, well, I have bone on bone, which personally I think is impossible because if you had bone on bone, you, you, you wouldn't move. But, but there's that space that's, that closes, so you're, you're getting maybe some contact there. That helps to take care of that issue. There are five tissues that construct a healthy joint and a diseased joint. Whatever this thing, whatever these cells land on, they're able to declare to become a brand new and healthy one of those. So those that land on bone are going to become new and healthy bone. Only healthy bone, not diseased bone. Land on synovium, as we've already mentioned. Those that land on cartilage are going to be able to uh, declare to become brand new cartilage, not diseased, because the code for becoming what it's going to become is the DNA. And that code hasn't changed since the day we came in the front door. When we were born, or when we were conceived, the DNA of that conception is what we carry this very day. Right. We develop the diseases of our lifetime for a whole bunch of reasons, much of uh, which our time is spent trying to help people not ever get there. But once there, um, we certainly want to try to make their lifestyles better and healthier and so forth, but we need a drastic turn around these So cases. these issues in the joint like arthritis and, and, and degenerative diseases of the joint and so forth, these stem cells can have to take care. What are some of the other reasons I would walk in, into your office for So I say if cells? you have a joint problem, you really don't have a problem. The one that is sort of amazing to me, even me, is a, a arena of treatment that I didn't even conceive of would be possible, and that is the lung, the diseases of the lung, and most particularly a whole crop of diseases that we call COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Which are rampant these this days. This is a degenerative disease of the lung occurring over a lifetime. Yes, it has a relationship to cigarette smoking and, and exposure to uh, uh, pollutants on the, of the job site and a whole host of other things. But this is an anatomical destruction. The, the alveoli of the lungs literally are destroyed. And once destroyed, there has been no way to get them to come back until now. So are you injecting this into the lung or are you injecting it into the bloodstream? Oddly enough, um, to inject it into the lung with a needle wouldn't do much good. What has to happen is you have to be able to seed 100% of the lung. And the only way to do that is through the vascular medium. So if you give anything IV... Um, it has to go and, through the lung eventually. Right. If, if, no matter what vein you use. All veins dump into the mother vein. The mother vein is the vena cava. The vena cava enters the right side of the heart. And as you were adept to pick up, all that blood goes to the first stop. And the first stop is the lung. That means all those cells are going to get trapped within the microvasculature of the lung and now come into contact with actual lung tissue. And so what happens in a knee can happen in the lung and wonderful results have been seen with patients with this chronic obstructive pulmonary situation for which there isn't even a surgery. I mean, if you're afflicted with COPD, uh, this is a terrible existence. See all the people when you're out and about walking around with, with, with oxygen tanks. Yeah. But I've, uh, I've already dealt with patients that say they couldn't make it from the couch to the refrigerator without a number of puffs on their inhaler. Um, and they tell me, my life's pretty much over. And well, if you can't breathe, it is. It is. Uh, but to see how they're responding to do, uh, to utilize these stem cells in that way uh, has been great, uh, greatly satisfying. To is me. it one treatment for these joints, one treatment for the lungs, or is it multiple treatments? As of right now, and remember I'm only two years into this, um, I've never had a patient, no, excuse me, I've had one ever come back and ask for a second injection. And by the way, that only happened last month. But that's one out of hundreds now. And so we 
probably use a little bit of a battle cry. We say one and done. It looks as though we only need one, or at least for the two years that I've been doing this, it's only required one. Now, whether there may be a need for more once more time has expired, I can't tell you yet. Don't know. But uh, this is a brand new arena of medicine. More is going to be learned about it. But I think that person who's had the two years worth of relief, um, who maybe doesn't even know they may require another injection, will be okay with it if it should ever come around. Okay. Because the relief to them was so demonstrably different than what life was like before the injection that they'll, 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 they'll be happy enough to do it again if they need to. So far, though, have been ne has not been necessary. So what other areas can we deposit these? I actually think now we have to get theoretical because with my skill set and what I can physically do, the joint is within that skill set, and certainly administering things IV are within my skill set. But I believe the sky's the limit. I, I believe that there really isn't an organ that we can't begin to think about being able to regenerate, to renew, to replenish, to recreate, uh, as long as we deliver the package to that organ and that organ alone. And I think the only way, this is theory now, okay, because this isn't being done anywhere, but I've certainly thought about it a great deal, is you're gonna have to deliver it through the blood vessels to that organ. So if, there, if the person has a right kidney that's failing, in fact, he may be confronting dialysis. In fact, he may be confronting transplant. If you could administer those cells to just the right kidney alone, through the right renal artery, I think you've got a chance to get that turned around. Amazing. I say that not knowing for sure, but all signs point to it. So as, as far as you treating a patient, you're taking care of joints, you possibly take care of some lung COPD issues. What, what about something like ED? A lot of people have that issue. This is, an, and when I give a presentation for Stem Cells 101, I always have somebody sitting in the audience that asks that question. Uh, because really that may be his health challenge. And he's truly interested in trying to find out, is there, is there a way to deal with it? And yes, ED is one of those areas that we can directly administer the stem cells and allow them to create what needs to be created in the case of ED, which are brand new blood vessels. Just another cell type. So it may not be bone, it may not be synovium, it may be the microvasculature of the penis itself, but recreatable. A lot of times because of diabetes and other issues that blood vessels... That was the reason for why we have yeah. this, because the person with diabetes, their blood vessels get so clogged that they don't function anymore and erection can't occur. Yeah. What about the eyes, Doc? Ah, you, 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 you found another soft spot in my heart, Edmund, as you well, well know. I'm an eye specialist. Yeah, I am. I've been working with eyes for a number of years, seven or eight years now, treating them uh, with a unique program that allows me to restore their lost vision. Um, and this is in the arena of retinal diseases where there is nothing in the, in the marketplace, nothing in the medical world. Forget about the marketplace. Ophthalmologists don't have a treatment for macular degeneration or glaucoma or retinitis pigmentosa or star guards or you name it, the list goes on. And those are issues that lead to blindness. And they lead, glaucoma in particular, total blindness and uh, are devastating. And, and really, they are hard pressed to be able to, to do anything once the diagnosis is made. That's a terrible situation to be in. Let's say, and I know we'll do another show on it sometime, that it is possible to reverse those disorders. Um, and that's what I've been involved with, uh, special programs, really three-day programs. And uh, to the extent that we have a very high success rate in that, um, it caused me to write a book um, out there to describe the process called uh, Restore Your Lost Vision Now, the three-step program to regain well, your sight. Well, you know, we should mention, I'm sure the audience would love to know this, but, but Dr. Courtney was picked to be in the top 20 alternative physicians in the country, which is, which is an incredible honor 
because there's a, there actually are a number of alternative positions. Tough to find, but every place, every area of the country has them. And, and, and you were chosen in the top 20, and I think I know about, personally know about five of the top 20 uh, yeah, very well, actually. Yeah. Um, I, admire, I admire all of them. Uh, to be selected in that group was certainly an honor. I, I often forget about this honor. It's just we do what we do, and sometimes we get recognized for it. Um, but uh, every one of those gentlemen brings something to the table that is different and unique. We're happy to be talking about the things that I do that are different and unique. Uh -huh. And um, the fact that our colleagues reward us for the contribution makes me feel pretty good. Yeah, th th these are the people that are in the industry, in, the, in, in medicine, that are giving you that honor. And uh, that, that it's incredible. So when we talk about the eyes, you were actually having this seminar, and we mentioned a little bit earlier, on February 13th uh, at the Airport Marriott at 7 o'clock again. Uh, now we're talking about the eye program. Huh? Yeah, the eye okay, program. So we're shifting gears. I want to make sure we don't confuse our listeners. Yeah. Stem Cells 101, we're going to start them this coming Monday. This January 15th, right. and then again February 12th, and then and then it'll, it'll have that every month. Exactly. But this eye program that you're Right. You're so have. in keeping with this educational theme, and we're all about education, you and I, it's really necessary to bring that, a message of how we can help the person with a serious eye disease that doesn't know these programs exist. So he too or she also needs to know that there is a way to stop the further progression of those serious eye diseases and regain what was lost. Um, and they're not going to be able to appreciate that through their very intelligent eye doctor who doesn't know about how to do that. So we're going to have, yes, in February, um, we're going to have a, an additional uh, seminar. By the way, still going to be held at the airport Marriott. It's just going to be on Tuesday, February 13th. At 7 o'clock again. At 7 o'clock. And that phone number is it's the same. 724-749-4558 is the phone number for both of the seminars. And that'll be the number each month because you're going to hold the stem cell seminar the, the, toward the middle second of the month. Monday. Second, second Monday. Second Monday of every, of every month. 2018 is a big educational push for me. So instead of doing my education one-on-one, -on -one, which is what I do when patients visit me, I need to get into an arena where I can see maybe 50 or 100 at a time, enrich them to the point that they are knowledgeable enough to make a medical decision that could change their lives. Stem cells are one of those arenas. I believe the eye programs are another. And um, just going back to the classroom, Edmund. No, I, it's important. I, I think education is the key to everything. And you know, we, we wouldn't be here if we weren't educated first of all, but you cannot make an informed consent if you don't have all the full view of everything. You need to have the pros, the cons, the goods, the bads, you know, all of, all of that. But there's information out there that you're not getting. You know, you made a, a reference to this earlier, and I'm going to expound upon it a little bit. Often you only get five minutes with your physician, oh. and, and, you, and you say, I have to go in and I have to educate every one of my patients. Well, that was my, my plan all the time. I never sat down and said to my patient, hey, we're doing this and, and see you later. We need to do this. This is why we need to do it. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times my patient said, thank you for sitting and taking the time to explain to me what, what we need done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of rare sometimes because it's, I, I've got five minutes with you. I need to, I need to move on. And, and I know this is what you need, and I've got to move on. And, and, and we see that. And with the big, the big uh, hospitals owning the medical practices anymore, it's even worse. Yeah, the poor, the medical, uh, the physician of today has to see a high volume of patients. They're compelled to by the payers, by the insurers to do so. So it's very little time. In fact, they've had to invent ways to even lessen the time. So there, there are now PAs and, and you're going to be seen by the nurse and the PA and the, and the tech, and if lucky, maybe you'll see the physician for a minute or two, and he's on his way. He's got to move because they have him. They have quotas, and they're reprimanded if they don't meet them. Exactly. So, so you don't do that. I never did that. 
your lectures, your conferences, your 101 classes, your stem cells 101, 101 is, is another way of you educating. And that's exceptional. And so you're to be commended for that as well. Uh, okay. Because, uh, again, educational. Do Dr. Courtney is actually uh, going to be on my radio show again, uh, a radio show for the first time this, um, this Saturday. This weekend. Which, which is the 13th. January 13th, <clears throat> 9 a.m. And I want to I want to mention this now because I think it's it's an important opportunity for people to actually have a chance to call in and speak with you. I look forward you to know, it. Uh, so it's uh, a.m. 1250. The answer, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Live call-in show this Saturday. Dr. Courtney will be on. I know time slips away with us on this show, and I wanted to get that in before I try to cram it in at the end. So. What other eye issues, because we're talking about the eyes right now, what other eye issues can, can you treat that uh, the average office doesn't do? Look, take the eye. When I, I as a non-eye professional, have to divide the eye to be able to have a discussion with my patients. So there's the anterior chamber of the eye. And that really involves corneal issues. And I am hard pressed. I really cannot help. I have nothing to offer. If it's corneal, we have a very developed uh, medical uh, uh, protocol for all, about all corneal issues, which leads all the way up to a transplant of the cornea, right? Mm -hmm. There's this middle chamber where we have the lens. Now, the lens has a condition that's pretty common called cataracts. And cataracts have a solution, just one solution in the medical world, and that is, Ooh. they say remove the cataract, but this is not removing a cataract. This is removing the lens. lens. I think that's a big deal, even though that's quite a successful surgery. Greater than 90, 95% of those surgeries turn out wonderful. It gets my grade a bit to think, don't ever go to a, it's my mantra. Surgery should always be put off to the last, last resort. resort. And um, I'm very happy for patients that can get their uh, resolution of their problem. I just say that maybe that's too quick. I think that, uh, by the way, I see that 5% that it didn't go well for, uh, who swear to me that the worst decision they ever made in their lives was to have the surgery. And knowing that that population actually exists, even though the number's so small, um, it is a caution. It's a precaution for everybody who might have cataracts. So, th if I'm correct in this, the, the earlier you treat a cataract, the better. Yeah, uh, to find out that the conventional medical community has no treatment, in keeping with also the retina of the eye, there is no treatment. The normal um, interaction with the eye professional is, oh, I see you have the beginnings of a cataract. And then we watch it. Yeah. They just say it's not, now they use a word, ripe, a word ripe. I don't know why. Maybe over time everything is going to ripen and they know it. But it's not ripe enough yet to do anything about it. I'll just keep watching it. And when the day finally comes that it's ripe enough, then we'll take it out. And... Um, a lot of people ultimately have to follow that pathway and uh, wait till the very end of the line, and they do get them dealt with in this surgical way. I just say, if we intervene early enough, people shouldn't need to arrive at that point. So, so if you have a full-blown cataract, then your procedure isn't as helpful? No, look, when you get to the point that the surgery is needed, the surgery is 90 to 95% very helpful. I'm, and I'm pleased for those that can have that. My own brother-in-law just the last couple of weeks got one of these done, uh, surgeries done. But because I know about that small percentage for which this has been devastating, and for some reason, if you botched this or if it didn't turn out well, that doesn't seem to be able to go back and like fix it. Right. Uh, this is a wrong spot to be in. You don't want to make that decision to find yourself in that even small population because you didn't know there was another option. There's, there are other things to do. So, so before you go ahead, and it, it's a wise decision to, to give Dr. Courtney's office a call and have an evaluation. Certainly, um, I would say come on out in February on the 13th.
to learn what these three-step programs are. Covered by insurance? None of it. Stem cells covered by insurance? None of it. Yeah. So it's out of pocket? All of them, yes. But, but you have a cure, basically. A possibility for some wonderful results and not too w long to wait to, to get them either. Um, no, I, I have to insist, nothing's 100%. Nothing ever is. Ever is, especially in medicine. But because I'm not involved with therapies for which we can harm, I mean, do no harm is supposed to be our pledge, right? Mm -hmm. And so to truly know that I can't hurt, we have a great possibility to help. Um, the risk versus benefit equation only can be determined by the patient himself. Doc, we have a minute. Would you tell us about your new office that you're opening? Well, um, now here I am, um, South Hills guy, born and raised. Uh, my office has been in Peters Township for the longest time, but we are going to be moving our offices. Um, we're getting a lot of interest and a lot of demand. We need to be more centrally located. So really, as 2018 progresses, our office is going to be moved out to the Parkway West at the Ridge Road exit. We're going to stay away from that craziness up there in Robinson Township. Everybody would love to avoid because that is nuts up there. But the Ridge Road exit is the easy on, easy off access. And this will be in February? Um, I'm certain that by the time March rolls around, we probably will have already changed our location completely. Uh, we're going to hate to see you leave the area, but you're not that far away. And it's easy accessibility off of 79 to the parkway. So, so you'll be there. Thanks for mentioning that, Edmund. Yeah. yeah. 2018 is a big year. Yes, it is. Dr. Dennis Courtney, his lectures, Stem Cells 101, and then the eye lecture in February. I'm going to try to get you back on before, before that lecture. All right, off. we'll do so. Right. Thank you so much for watching Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet, and when we're healthy, we're happy too. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.